and Revelation 16, 1 through 11. Today, I'm going to share with you a message about the seven bowls of God's wrath or the bowl judgments of God. Now, because it's quite lengthy, we are going to divide it into two parts. This week, we're going to look at the first five bowls of God's wrath. And then next week, we'll look at the last two bowls of God's wrath. Now, let me explain this to you also that the seven bowls of God's wrath or the bold judgments of God are also known as the seven plagues of the seven angels. But also, if you recall in chapter 8, that this was also called the third woe. There were three woes. The first woe was the sounding of the fifth trumpet. The second woe was the sounding of the sixth trumpet. And the third woe is the sounding of the seventh trumpet, which is the pouring of the seven bowls of God's wrath. Now once again, this is going to be the last and final judgment of God on earth during the great tribulation time. And so we can have a better understanding of it, especially if you have missed out some Sundays. Let's just have a review of what great tribulation period is about. It is the one that would come right after rapture. Now hear me out. What is rapture? Rapture is a time when all the believers will be caught up in the air to be with Jesus and be with Him forever and ever. However, the unbelievers would be left behind here. And at the moment that we disappear, Christians, they would enter the great tribulation time. The great tribulation time is seven years long and it is a cataclysmic seven years like no other. And then after that seven years of great cataclysmic events, then comes the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ, the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then after the millennial reign, which is a thousand years, then there comes the great white throne judgment of God. Now, speaking of judgment, why is it difficult for some people, even Christians, to believe that God will judge this world? That God's wrath is looming and it's coming to this God-hating, sinful world? Why is it difficult for many people, even Christians, to believe that God's judgment is coming? Considering that even today, this world is under the judgment of God already. Right. Look at what it says in Romans 1.18. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Pay attention to that verse and notice that the wrath of God is being revealed as we speak. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Perhaps. I'm not saying it is, but perhaps that's why we experience some cataclysmic event or catas catastrophic event or school shooting or all on, these man. bad things. Perhaps. Come on, perhaps. Man. Come on, man. Because the judgment of God, the wrath of God, is being revealed to godlessness and wickedness. Mm -hmm. Yet centuries after centuries, faithful preachers have come and gone preaching about this looming judgment of God. And yet while it's being preached and taught in churches and in different places, yet an average person still believes God is not going to judge anyone because He loves everyone, even of those who rebelled against Him. So I went to a patient's room and the volume of our television was quite loud. I guess she was enjoying the show. And then when I looked on the television, well, she was watching a show I don't really like watching. It's The View. It's on TV, I believe on Channel 8, every single day. And it's uh, a panel of women discuss discussing, talking about current events. You probably have seen it, The View. There's Joy Behar and Whoopi Goldberg, and I believe the daughter of Senator John McCain. And uh, that morning, May 22nd, the topic was this, Pope Francis of the Roman Catholic faith embraces all gay Catholics. 
So they begin to kind of expound on that. And what basically, what, what was behind it was Pope Francis of the Catholic, Roman Catholic faith is now believing that all gay people are loved by God, which is true. But he also believes that all gay people are created by God to become gays. But at the same time, that God is not going to judge them at all because God loves everyone. That's right. That's right. So now the ladies on that panel began to chime in. Different thoughts, different ideas, and people in the crowd were applauding them because, see, this is acceptance. This is tolerance. This is what Jesus is all about, especially the part when Whoopi said this. Whoopi Goldberg said this. I love that though. Because he is like Jesus, all inclusive. But isn't Jesus all inclusive? He loves everyone. On, and he's not on, going man. to judge anyone, even if they violated his laws. Imagine how many people are watching that. And the first thing that came to my mind is this if Jesus is all inclusive, if Jesus loves everyone, and if Jesus, which is true, and if Jesus is not going to judge anyone, why did he say this? Come on, Matthew man. 7, 13 and 14. Enter through the narrow gate. <laughs> For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And men, many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. But notice, he gave the emphasis on it leads to destruction. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And in these verses and in the book of Revelation, we see a different story, don't we? Yes, sir. Which is the thesis of this sermon today, and that is God's judgment is coming to this God-hating world, the sinful world, and that God is going to destroy this civilization. That's right. That's right. Come God's on, man. judgment is coming. Yes, sir. And here we are going to see the looming judgment of God as found in the seven bowls of His wrath as we now read them, as we stand please, in honor of the reading of God's Word in Revelation 16, and we're going to read verses 1 through 11. Revelation 16, 1 through 11. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go! Pour out the seven bowls of wrath, of God's wrath, on the earth. The first angel went and poured out his bowl on the land. And ugly and painful sores broke out on the people who had the bark of the beast and worshipped his image. The second angel poured out his bowl on the sea. and turned out into blood like that of a dead man. And every living thing in the sea died. The third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. Then I heard the angel in charge of the water say, You are just in these judgments, you who are and who were, and the Holy One, because you have so judged. For they have shed the blood of your saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink as they deserve. And I heard the altar respond, Yes, Lord God Almighty. True and just are your judgments. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and the sun was given power to scorch people with fire. They were seared by the intense heat, and they cursed the name of God, who had control over these plagues, but they refused to repent and glorify him. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom was plunged into darkness. Men gnawed their tongues in agony, and curse the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, but they refuse to, to repent of what they have done. You may be seated. Now in the context, once again, this is now God's last and final judgment on earth and her inhabitants during the great tribulation time. This would complete the three series of seven judgments of God. Let's have a quick Bible study just to refresh our minds of those three series of God's seven judgments. You remember how it began there in Revelation 6 with the opening of the seven seals. 
After the opening of the seven seals, it was followed by the sounding or the blasting of the seven trumpets. And now that seven trumpets will be concluded with the pouring of the seven bowls. But unlike with the seven seals and with the sounding of the seven trumpets, where it only affected the earth partially, henceforth the use of fractions such as a third of the sun was affected, or a third of the water was affected, or a third of mankind was affected, something to that effect. But it also affected not just the unbelievers and the earth, but also the Christians who came to Christ during the Great Tribulation time. However, here in the seven bowls, it will be a different story because this will not be partial. It will be universal. This is not just going to be partial. It's going to be worldwide. In other words, the seven bowls of God's wrath would affect the entire world, the entire globe, but also only the non-Christians. Because at this point, as we learned last week in Revelation 15, the Christians who came to Christ during the Great Tribulation time within that seven-year period will be now in heaven worshiping God in His worship center in heaven. Praise God. You see that in Revelation 15. But the word bowl is a common household container like this one. You probably use this at home, this mixing bowl or a soup bowl, or any kind of bowl that you may have. It's a common household container. And so the idea there was John saw that bowl looking, and he also saw that it was filled with, with liquid or with fluid, that when it was poured on earth, that means when the angel overturned the bowl, it poured God's wrath onto the world. Mm -hmm. So therefore, it was a bowl because it was filled with God's wrath, overturned by the angel as commanded or instructed by God. Amen. But notice here that you will see that each bowl did contain something in there that is severe, yes, sir. that yes, sir. is miserable to those who were there during the Great Tribulation time. Look at verse 1. Then I, that's the Apostle John, heard a loud voice from the temple, and we would presume that's God's voice, commanding the seven angels, Go, pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath on the earth. Once again, just to have a, a, a picture of what was happening, so the angels were holding the bowl, and God said, Go. There was no delay. Go, pour it. It is now time. And now, again, each bowl contains a wrath of God. And here, you will see that they were similar to some of the plagues that God sent to Egypt and to Pharaoh during the time of Moses in the book of Exodus. But let's look at the first bowl. Bowl number one is filled with ugly and painful sores. Look at verse 2. The first angel went and poured out his bowl in the land, and ugly and painful sores broke out on the people who had the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. Now that's quite interesting because notice that the bowl has a specific recipient. There are those designated people who are supposed to receive this ugly and painful sores. And who would that be? Those who received the mark of the beast and who worshipped his image. Now we learned this in Revelation 13. That those who reject God and the Lord Jesus Christ and follow the beast, the Antichrist, would receive the name of the beast on their forehead and at the back of their head. And that was mandatory because that would give them economic and physical protection. We got the mark of the beast, which is the name of the beast, which is 666. In my opinion, I truly believe that is what's going to be it. The number 6. 6-6 six, six, would be stamped on the forehead and on the back of the head of every non-believer so they will be able to buy and sell and be physically protected by the beast. Mm. Come on, but notice man. here, he lied to them. Yes, he did. Because notice here that he was not able to protect them from God's wrath because they experienced the ugly and painful sores that broke out on the people. Did you notice that? But this bowl resembles or mimics the sixth plague that God sent to the Egyptian people during the time of Moses. And you see that in Exodus chapter 9. It was also sores. 
painful, ugly source. So what's interesting is in the original language of the New Testament, this sour literally means a boil. You know what a boil is. <laughs> it's an infection. It makes your skin swell up and it would have that, that abscess on top of it. Now what's quite interesting is in a further study of the description of ugly and painful sores, it came about that it literally means it is a malignant, continual, malevolent, yes, evil, yes, injurious, harmful yes. boils all over. Yes. So it's not just going to be on those hot spots in our bodies that they normally would come up. But it will be all over from head to toe. Okay. Now imagine having boils all over you. Mm. And I thought of myself, because here for the last two weeks, I have been dealing with hives. I've been breaking in hives because I might be allergic to something. And we haven't find out about it or found out about it yet. And so I have been to three different doctors already. They have given me a steroid shot and given me strong medicine and cream and, and different treatments and, and to no avail. Until I begin to ask, of course, my family and the church family to pray for me and I begin to feel better. I am still dealing with it, but, but because of the cream or because of the medication, I would get some relief from it. But, but look at this. I could not imagine having these boils all over me without any kind of relief. Unbelievable. Oh, yeah. But notice now, look at bowl number two. A sea turned into blood, killing all sea life. Look at verse 3. The second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it turned into blood like that of a dead man. And every living thing in the sea died. Now, this bowl, wherein the sea turned into blood, resembles or mimics the first plague in Egypt, wherein the Nile River, the water in the Nile River, turned into blood. You see that in Exodus chapter 7. But what's quite interesting is this is a wrath of God or a plague of God that he partially already sent during the time when he sounded the second trumpet. Remember the time in Revelation 8 when God threw this blazing mountain into the sea and it killed so many marine life, but also it turned the third of the sea into blood? But here, with the bowl, it would turn not just a third of the sea, but all of the seas. Every part of the ocean would turn blood. Now, I was thinking about that. Imagine that all of the sea would turn blood. But with 75%, 75% of the Earth's surface is covered with ocean. Oh, yeah. So that means 75% of the Earth would be covered with blood. Imagine the stench coming out from those that died from it, people and marine life. But at the same time, it is proven that 50 to 80% of all life and source of food come from the water, come from the ocean. So that means 80% of the source of food will be taken out. There would be lacking food during the time. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. And so now with all your boils and now you're not able to eat, I don't want to be there. I don't want that in my life. But look at bowl number three. Rivers and springs turned to blood. Look at verse 4. The third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. Notice that it, this is in succession. This is in consecutive fashion. This is not just turning the, the sea water into blood, and then the source, and then pause. No, there was no pause. It was a in succession because now after turning the sea water into blood, now the rivers and the springs water became blood. This is also similar to the sounding of the third trumpet. Remember when the asteroid fell on the rivers and the springs of water, which simply means this, fresh water. And remember that fallen star or that star that fell, it's known as the warm wood and it made the water bitter and it killed a lot of people. But that's only a third, but this time all of the rivers, all of the body of water, all fresh waters will be affected. Oh yeah. 
So that means they have no food because there is no more food coming out from the ocean. Mm -hmm. So that means they are still hurting and, and full of sores and boils. Now they don't have clean drinking water. Mm. Not only that there's going to be amount of, a great amount of dehydration that would lead to more agony, but how are they going to wash their sores in boils? Mm -hmm. Isn't that it you would give you some relief if you have some kind of a sore or a boil and, and you use fresh water, especially if it's hurting and you use cold water, it alleviates some of the discomfort. Yes, sir. And yes, sir. I, I thought of my hives again. Hmm. That, that the intense heat would bring this, this pain in me, and so therefore I would take a shower in cold, fresh water, and I would drink cold water, and it would give me some relief. But here, there would be no relief, because there would be no fresh water. But on top of it, not only that there is no fresh water, we all know this, a person can survive without food for 21 days but without fresh clean water less than 10 days but before the pouring out of the fourth bowl notice that there was a small brief interlude finally the mercy of god gave them a little break because look at verses 5 through 7 there was an interlude and we should be familiar with the interludes or the intervals or the pauses or breaks in the book of Revelation. It, quite, it was quite frequent that every time God would want to have a worship service, He would put a pause on the judgment. Every time He wants to gather all the believers to worship Him, there was a pause. But notice here, this is different. The pause came or the, in, the interval came from an angel who exonerates God from being blamed as his judgment being too harsh. Notice there in verse 5 that the angel of the waters. Now there's a lot of lesson we can learn there. Once again, not only that there is the hierarchy of angels, that means there are those who are serving strictly God. There are those who are serving the, the beings in heaven, but there are also those angels who are serving us, Come on, man. Come ministering on, man. to us yes, on a daily basis. Yes, that angel is right next to you, perhaps right now, shoving you and say, listen, you learned something. Come on, man. But notice here also that there are angels in hierarchy or pecking order that this angel is in charge of the waters. So that means there are angels who are in charge of the land, That's right. in charge of fresh water, yes, in charge of different parts of this world. But notice what it says. Verse 5. You are just in these judgments, you who, are, you who are and who were the Holy One, because you have so judged. So here, the angel of God exonerates God, you know, I absolve God, Clear the name of God so God won't be blamed and, and be accused of being or sending out a severe judgment because he says it is just for you. This judgment, this judgment is justified by you, God. Why? Because you are eternally holy. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Say that. Say that. God hmm. is holy. Yes, he is. Maybe if there's one thing you would like to take home with you as you're to go or take out learning is that God is holy. God is holy. That means He is set apart. There's none like Him. There is no sin in Him. There's no evil in Him. There's no bad things in Him. We are so not like Him. And because He is holy, He will not let the guilty go unpunished. That's right. That's right. Say that. Then why would people believe, actually believe that God would not punish people even if they violate God's laws or they rebelled against God and they rejected God? How come people still believe that God is still the sweet, loving, you know, non-judgmental God and God is not going to judge anyone because He is such a good God? When clearly here we are told because He is holy, His holiness demands that he judges those who violated his laws. And how could we say or think 
that God is not going to judge when we ourselves, when we are mistreated, when we are wronged, we are lawsuit happy people. When we are mistreated at the restaurant, we didn't get the right prime rib we want. We ask for a medium rare and we end up getting a well done. We fuss and complain, don't we? I want to speak to the manager yeah, that's because right. I want the full extent of the law to be given to this waitress who mistreated me because I did not get my medium rare steak. Instead, I got a well done steak. I made it anyway. How many times we fuss about that? Don't lie. We all do it. That's right. That's right. When you feel that when we are wronged by people, we demand that this would be taken care of. And, and yet, and yet with God, think about that. How could we say, oh God, God is a loving God, He's a sweet God, God is not going to judge anyone, considering that we violated His laws. That's right. That's right. If you truly believe that, that God is not going to judge anyone, that is not the God of the Bible. That's right. That's that right. God does not exist. Hmm. Come on, I thought man. of the story I shared with you several weeks ago about Dr. Jeremiah, a pastor there in California, and he preached a sermon about hell. And after his sermon, one of the members, one of the elderly there, went up to him and said, Dr. Jeremiah, my pastor, let me tell you one thing about hell. My God, and she repeated herself, my God would not send anyone to hell. Dr. Jeremiah, Pastor Jeremiah responded to her and said, You are right. Your God is not going to send anyone to hell because your God does not exist. So true. If you believe that God is not going to judge anybody, that God is not the God of the Bible. But there's a second reason why the angel exonerates God from being charged as too harsh with his judgment. And that is because God is going to avenge his people. Look at verses 6 and 7. For they have shed the blood of your saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink as they deserve. They deserve it. They are worthy because they killed your people. They shed the blood of your people. God is going to judge. Because of all the saints, all the Christians, all the prophets, all the pastors, all the Christians that have died centuries and centuries and centuries then and now. Because they killed them. God is going to avenge them. But here in the context, what he's saying here is God is going to avenge the blood that was shed of those who were killed, Christians who were killed during the Great Tribulation time. Remember in Revelation 6, where the souls of those who were murdered and martyred during the Great Tribulation were at the altar of the Lord and they were crying out to God. Look at Roma, uh, Revelation 6, 9 and 10. It says this, When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had obtained, they called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge your blood? It took a little while, but this is God's answer to that cry for vengeance. This is God's vengeance, the pouring of His bowls on those who shed the blood of His Christians. But look at bowl number four. The scorching heat of the sun. Verses 8 and 9. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun. And the sun was given power to scorch people with fire. They were seared by the intense heat. Now normally you would think the sun gives light, energy, warmth to sustain life. But during this time, it would be a different story. The sun would give intense Eat. How can really can, can, can Jesus really do that? Oh, yeah. Whatever you want to do. Jesus can easily move our earth's axis a millimeter and it will burn earth. Ooh. Or he can easily pull the sun closer to earth to create that intense heat. That's right. Ooh. It's not that it is impossible. Nothing is impossible to he to him. But I was thinking, imagine that with the intense heat. 
You are full of sores all over you. There is no food. There is no clean water to drink. There is no fr fresh water to wash your sores. And now you add the heat. And going back to my hives, and you're probably getting tired of hearing me sharing about my hive story. That's all right. Tell it. But one of the things that flare up, or would flare up my hives, is heat. And so it would, I would break again into hives even though it's gone every time I'm exposed to heat. So I would try once again to get into a cold shower or drink cold water to get some relief. But here, there would be no shower room they can run to to get a fresh water to wash away their source there would be no refrigerator no cold water in it to drink some cold water to give them some relief imagine combining all of it no food heat source or boils and then no fresh water and again no food you would think that the first thing they would do is they would finally cry out to God because obviously this is coming from God. The Bible says that they knew that the plagues came from God and you would assume say that, that they would that. entreat God and plead to God and say, God have mercy on us. Yeah, that's right. That's right. But no. Look at what they did. Look at that verse. They cursed, the verse 8 and 9, they cursed the name of God who had control over these plagues, uh -huh. but they refused to repent and glorify Him. Amen. I, I don't understand that. I, that is something, it's hard for me to, to, to fathom, it's hard for me to comprehend. How could you not? How could you not cry out to God in this situation to make yourself better, instead they were bitter? That's right. Instead of getting better, they were bitter to God. They cursed God. They blasphemed God. Yes. Blasphemed God, meaning they hated God even more. And so instead of asking God for mercy, turning to God, they turned away from God and they refused to repent from their sins. Let me tell you another hive story. Come on, man. Come so while in the middle of this, this hives attacking man, and I did not sleep all night long one day last week but I have to go to work and so the first thing I did as I would normally do I went to my room I did my quiet time and I remember just crying out to God I said God I need relief as a matter of fact I, I don't remember ever praying anything else other than the same words that came out of my, 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 my mouth was give me relief God give me relief I don't know how I'm going to go to work I don't know how I'm going to treat patients I, I don't know how I'm going to handle this being there all day long when I have all this itches and discomfort and, and burning and all these rashes all over me I, I don't know God give me relief give me relief God in, in, his, in his grace and mercy that was the time that I was reading Lamentations 3 in Lamentations 3 the prophet Jeremiah was crying out to God and he was saying the same thing. He said, God, give me relief. God, give me relief from all these consequences, from all the bad things we have done. And guess the second verse after that, you know what it says? He says, I will give you relief and I will redeem you. And so I just grabbed that verse and I took it to my heart and I went to work and I said, God, I believe you are going to relieve me. You're going to give Come me relief that. and you're that. going to redeem me. And guess what? All day long, I was fine. Hallelujah. But you would think when a person is struggling in life, when the going gets tough, you would think the very first thing they would do is cry out to God and entreat God. Right. But instead here, with this situation, they blaspheme God. Do you know blasphemy is from the root word once again blasphemy, oh, hating God? But the truth is, they are not hating God as in hating God, but instead of this, hear me out. If there's another thing you would like to take home, blasphemy means this they refused to repent. The cardinal sign, the cardinal sign of a person with a hardened heart for God is unrepentant heart. How about you? Have you truly repented of your sin? Oh, yeah. Or are you still wallowing in the, the thing is joy of sin? Listen. A hardened heart 
is a heart without repentance or true repentance. That's right. That's right. That's right. But notice here also that in spite of the hardship that have come their way, they cursed God, and in spite of the punishment, there was still no repentance because I love what Dr. J. Vernon McGee said about this. Look at what he said. This reveals that the human heart is incurably wicked. No amount of punishment will purify it and change it. And I thought of it. It's so true. <laughs> Because it's only God that can change a person's heart. That's right. That's the, right. No, no amount of punishment, no amount of scolding, Say no it. amount of discipline can change a person other than God can change yes. a person's yes. heart. Yes, sir. Have yes, you ever sir. wondered why we have some repeat offenders huh. of the man. same crime? Mm -hmm. I mean, they have suffered already behind bars. Yes, they have suffered already being incarcerated. But yes. as soon as they came out of the jail, what do they do? They commit the same crime because their heart did not change. Why? Because punishment does not purify or change a heart. Only God can change a person's heart. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Maybe your kids are so stubborn. Maybe your kids are rebellious. Maybe you know people that are so bad the, yes. the way you look at yes. them and you have done all this punishment, all this all this scolding, all this discipline, and, and you have given them tough love and, and you wonder why or how come they are still not changing? Because perhaps you have not called out to God That's right. to change your child's heart. That's right. That's right. Say that. Say Only that. Only God can purify and change a person's heart. Not necessarily punishment. And look at ball number five. Darkness of the kingdom of the beast and pain on humans. Look at verses 10 and 11. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom was plunged into darkness. Well, that's quite interesting because he is in the dark already. But here, he was even plunged even more into darkness. And men gnawed their tongues in agony. They were in pain. Do you know that darkness brings pain? Oh, yeah. Because darkness creates chaos, confusion, loneliness, depression. So to me, this would be enough for me because I could not stand this anymore. How much more the six and seven bowls but just this five bowls. If we just go back to it, now these people have source, incurable source, mm -hmm. no food That's because right. water is turned to blood, no more drinking water because river waters are now blood, there's now this scorching heat from the sun, and now this darkness. Now I cannot even see anything. That's hell. That's right. That's right. In hell, the only thing that people would hear there would be more mourning and groaning from all the agony associated with hell. But here, there was hell on earth, and you would think that they would finally say, God, I give up. I am throwing the white flag of surrender, and you win, and I'm sorry. Say that. Is that what they did? Yeah. Good verse 10 and 11. They gnawed their tongues in agony. Now watch me. The word gnaw literally means chew. Instead of crying out to God, they chewed their tongue. That is a sign of a person hating someone. Have you noticed that? What's the first thing that a person would do just to control his or her lips, before saying a bad thing to someone, they would gnaw mm -hmm. or chew on their tongue, don't they? Mm -hmm. ah. <laughs> That's a picture there. That's right. They were That's chewing right. their tongues, and instead of repenting, look at verse 11, they curse God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, but they refuse to repent what they had done. That's right. They continued to curse God and they refused to repent. Why? Because of their hardened heart. Sounding like Pharaoh when he refused yes. to let the people of Israel That's go. Right. That's right. That's because right. the Bible says because his heart was hardened, he was not repentant. 
right. Now, once again, next week we're going to continue with six and seven bowls of God's wrath. But you're probably wondering, wow, I don't like those in my life. How can we apply these judgments or these truths that we learn today on a daily basis? What did we learn here? I believe there are two life applications. The first one is this. Don't believe in the lie that God will not judge anyone because He will. God's judgment is coming to this God-hating world and He will destroy this civilization. I know many people don't like that, but scriptures after scriptures, we see passages confirming this, such as here in Revelation 16. I just see it this way. If our bill companies have the audacity to send us bills, of course, light bill, water bill, phone bill, and if we don't pay our bill, then we're going to be in trouble and suffer the consequence. God is going to send His bill. And those who reject Him would suffer the consequence of it. A second life application we can learn here is this. Not everyone will believe in God, but we have a responsibility to warn people about God's impending judgment. It's true. Some people will not believe. Some of you here are not believing. I hope that you do. But some people would believe in God. Some people won't. That's just the truth. That's just the fact of life and the fact of God and the fact of the scriptures. But how would we know? that this person is not going to believe or believe unless we reach out to them and lovingly explain to them about God's pending judgment. Mm -hmm. you following me here? Yes, sir. We have a responsibility. Amen. Hear me out. We have a responsibility <coughs> to warn people about God's looming judgment. <coughs> we cannot just keep it to ourselves because that's the most selfish thing we can do. We have a responsibility yes, to tell someone, God loves you. That's yeah. Right. Right. God loves right. you. Yes, and He loves you so that you, so you won't be suffering the consequence or the judgment of God. And so therefore, He wants to save you. That's right. The most loving thing we can do to someone is to tell them God loves you. He wants to save you from His judgment. I like what Dr. Robert Jeffers said, or, or the way he explained it. The most loving thing we can do for our unbelieving family, friends and people in our circle of influence for anyone, is to clearly communicate this essential doctrine to them. A doctrine or teaching that apart from Christ, judgment is coming. We have a responsibility to tell someone about God's looming judgment. God's judgment is coming to this world and He will destroy this civilization. Let's start telling people because it's the most loving thing we can do.